you're a sports fan, you've likely suffered through some tough times with your team. Eras of ineptitude, seasons of frustration, those moments where you wonder why you even bother. It's where most Vancouver Canucks fans found themselves in the late 90s. There wasn't much to cheer about. The team was only a few years removed from its greatest moment in franchise history, but it probably felt like it had been decades. So much had changed from that magical playoff run less than a handful of years earlier, and there wasn't much reason to believe it would ever happen again. It was a dark and seemingly hopeless time. But one team changed all of that. A team that captivated Vancouver and eventually the NHL. A collection of players who played fun, exciting hockey in a league that had become nearly devoid of it. That group was led by a line that came to symbolize a remarkable period in Canucks hockey. The trio of Marcus Nasland, Todd Bertuzzi, and Brendan Morrison. Dubbed the West Coast Express, their meteoric rise to NHL stardom was as unexpected as it was spectacular. Their sudden demise was hard to believe, yet impossible to forget. Their profound impact forever altered the Canucks franchise and its fan base. This is their story, and their words, and those who were close to them. This is Unreal. West Coast Express. We put that team back on the map, man. Like, there were some bleak times there for a while. For that next five or six years, he was the best power forward in the game. There was a confidence that we believed if we went out and played the way we were capable, we could score every shift. Now it's kind of league-wide. I want to come see the West Coast Express, you know, see these guys in action. That line sold tickets. That line cared about the community. That line gave back. We knew that we would never be satisfied unless we would win the cup. Everything, the whole thing. It's like a bad nightmare happened. In a matter of seconds, I mean, lives basically changed forever. To truly understand the impact the West Coast Express had on the Vancouver Canucks and their fan base, you have to understand where they came from and what they'd been through. Not just Marcus Naslin, Todd Bertuzzi, and Brendan Morrison, but the Canucks and their fans as well. And in order to do that, you have to go back to 1994. In the spring of 94, the Canucks initiated an improbable charge through the Western Conference playoffs and came within a whisker of winning one of the most memorable Stanley Cup finals in modern history. They battle in the circle. Puck goes to the corner. The game is over. And the New York Rangers have won the Stanley Cup for the first time since 1940, defeating the Vancouver Canucks 3-2 in a classic climax to a great series. Vancouver had come agonizingly close to clinching its first ever cup, falling in seven games to a heavily favored New York Rangers team, captained by Mark Messier and coached by Mike Keenan. Took a tremendous, tremendously deep commitment by a group of people to be able to accomplish this win tonight. Then we were playing one hell of a hockey club that was deeply committed as well. Pat Quinn and his coaching staff and his team played extremely hard and they did a hell of a job for canucks fans the enduring image of that series is their exhausted and emaciated captain trevor linden wrapping his arm around goaltender kirk mclean after forcing the deciding game back at madison square garden it was a great run and it was, it was a lot of fun oh, tough to get this far uh and lose and it was to go out say in the first or second round yeah it's, it's tough i think that uh I, 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 when you when you have your eyes set on, on a goal and on a prize, I think that uh, anything less than you're disappointed. As heartbreaking as that Game 7 loss was, there was plenty to be optimistic about. The vast majority of the near championship roster was returning, and a brand new arena was under construction in downtown Vancouver. That venue would also be home to the city's incoming NBA expansion franchise, which had been announced just as the Canucks were beginning their memorable march to the cup final. According to iconic Vancouver broadcaster Don Taylor, it felt like the beginning of a prosperous era. I think the assumption was that the Stanley Cup final was going to happen for the next few years, or at least some playoff success would happen. 
for several year, years after 94. And, and a lot of excitement in the city with the Grizzlies coming to town a, as well. And let's also not forget that you had a new arena coming too. So it, it was just such a hot market at the time. On the surface, everything was coming up Vancouver. In fact, no one suspected such seemingly positive developments would have such a detrimental effect on the Canucks in the relatively near future. 93-94 was also Marcus Naslin's rookie season in the NHL. Pittsburgh Penguins are proud to announce our draft pick from Moto Sweden, Marcus Naslin. Marcus Naslin from Moto Sweden is here. A left winger, 5'11", 176 pounds. 18 years of age, and he is the newest member of the Pittsburgh Penguins. Despite having been selected 16th overall in the 1991 draft by the Pittsburgh Penguins, Naslin spent the next two seasons playing professionally in Sweden for his hometown club, Modo. Well, I, I actually went over for, for the, you know, their camp the year prior to me moving over to North America, and, and uh, I had a, a pretty good camp, and they uh, wanted to keep me, but I uh, I decided to move back and, and play a year in Sweden just to mature and get ready. And I, I just, for some reason, I, I I don't think I was prepared mentally. His decision proved to be a good one. Playing with his childhood friend, Peter Forsberg, Naslin was among the top scorers in the Swedish Elite League, and the duo dominated the World Junior Tournament, combining for a gaudy 55 points in just seven games with Team Sweden. That set the stage for joining a star-laden Penguins roster headlined by Mario Lemieux and Yaramir Jager in the fall of 1993. It seemed like a perfect scenario for success. I did get chance when I came the next year and didn't want to step on anyone's toes and, and didn't really have the confidence either. So I, I took a, a back seat and struggled big time, struggled both on and off the ice. I, I, I was homesick. It was obviously a different time back then when you you weren't connected like you are now with phone and, and internet and, 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 and all that stuff. So um, it was a, it was a big move for me living in one small city for my whole life and then moving over and, and not having su- success because I think if I were to have a, a good season and enjoyed hockey, everything else would have fell, fell into place, but I didn't. The Swedish sniper managed a meager four goals and 11 points over 71 games as a rookie, despite playing on one of the highest scoring teams in the entire league. It was far worse than anyone would have predicted, including the man many consider the greatest coach in NHL history. The man who told Canucks commentator Jim Robson to keep his eye on Naslin long before he'd even played his first NHL shift. I was in Pittsburgh, I guess it would have been 93 or 4, somewhere there, when Scotty Bowman was coaching the Penguins. And I was at the morning skate and I sat near the ice, right by the tunnel where the Pittsburgh players would leave the ice to go to their room after the morning skate. And at the end of their morning skate, there were two or three players still on the ice skating around. Obviously, they weren't going to play that night. So I left my seat and I went through the tunnel and to talk to Scotty Bowman, who was always very cooperative. I really enjoyed talking to Scotty. And I asked him about uh, this young, who's that young player out there? He said, that's a young Swede. His name is Marcus Naslin. He said, he's got good skill. He's going to be a good player. But he didn't play very much at that time. And he wouldn't play at all in the near future. In fact, Naslin would have to wait a lot longer than expected for a shot at redemption, as he and the rest of the NHL players were locked out by the owners in September of 94. A shortened season finally began in January of 95, but much like the previous campaign, Naslin struggled to find his game. He registered just two goals and four points in the 14 games he suited up for the Penguins, and for the second straight year was not included on Pittsburgh's playoff roster. Across the continent, the Canucks were also playoff bound after a middling regular season. Pat Quinn had handed the coaching reins over to his longtime assistant, Rick Lee, instead choosing to focus his efforts on his role as general manager. And while those Canucks didn't fashion a surge similar to 94, as longtime beat writer Ian McIntyre noted, they did exact a small measure of revenge during that postseason. The season after they went to the Cup was still a pretty good one, even though it was shortened. Ricky Lee was the coach, and they went to the second round of the playoffs. They knocked off Mike Keenan's St. Louis 
Blues, which was a terrific storyline because, of course, Keenan had been with the Rangers. The satisfaction of defeating Keenan's crew didn't soothe the sting of being swept in round two by the Chicago Blackhawks. Feeling the Canucks needed more firepower in order to compete with the top tier of the Western Conference, Quinn broke form and pulled off a blockbuster trade for a big-name player. The Canucks packaged youngsters Mike Pekka and Mike Wilson along with their first-round draft pick in exchange for superstar scorer Alexander McGillney and a fifth-round pick from Buffalo. It was the kind of move that had the hockey world abuzz, the kind of move the Canucks were rarely involved in. George McPhee was Vancouver's director of hockey operations at the time and recalls it had everything to do with Quinn's belief in his group. I think that that's what Pat was thinking at the time, that uh, he was such an elite talent. And uh, we saw what Pavel Burry had done for that club. He was an, an elite talent on, on that team that went to the finals. And then we had a lot of very good players playing as well as they could play. And as a result, it was a good team. And I think that Pat's uh, thinking was that if we can add another elite talent and keep the same core and be just as uh, competitive that it would increase our chances to to win. So I don't know if it was um, so much a philosophical change. You know, Pat just saw a good player uh, that was available, was uh, still young enough and brought speed and competitiveness and, and, and that ability to score. I think he was hoping that would put us over the top. Everybody thought it was a no-brainer because of the connection with Pavel Bure. People thought that Alex McGillney would, was going to come into Vancouver and the two Russians were going to blow away the rest of the National Hockey League. And they had done that, not in the National Hockey League, but they had this great connection in junior hockey at the World Juniors. The buzz that was created by that, the possibility of Bure and McGillney hooking up on the same line, even though they were both wingers, it just never really materialized. But initially, you think about it, the 94 drive, a bit of a disappointing season the next go around, new arena, Grizzlies coming in to town you had to compete with them for attention you get mcgillney yeah there there was there was a lot of buzz in town and mcgillney proved it was warranted scoring 18 goals in his first 20 games with his new team but the canucks were giving up goals faster than mcgillney could score them and won just five of those first 20 games making matters worse vancouver's preeminent russian superstar pavel bure tore his acl in early november ending his season and the dream of rekindling his magic with mcgillney After just 15 games, the Canucks managed just one victory the rest of the month and struggled to overcome the loss of their electric winger. Over in the Eastern Conference, life was decidedly better for Nasland and the Penguins. After spending a year away from hockey in order to get himself healthy, living legend Mario Lemieux had returned to captain the Pens and immediately served notice that both he and the Penguins were forces to be reckoned with. Lemieux amassed 40 points in his first 12 games and quickly propelled Pittsburgh to the top of the standings. Everyone in the Penguins lineup benefited from Super Mario's dominance, including Nasland. The first two years in, in Pittsburgh were, were somewhat difficult, uh, and, and uh, I got sent down uh, both years to the um, IHL and, and played played some games there. And my third year, I finally got a chance to play and took advantage of it too and then played good minutes and, and got the chance to play for a bit with Mario Lemire as well on the line with him, which was a great experience, obviously, playing with the best player in the world. Naslin quickly surpassed his modest career totals, posting an impressive 40 points in just 35 games. The 22-year-old celebrated the midway mark of that season by scoring twice in an 8-5 victory over the Canucks and it appeared as though he was finally set to fulfill the promise he had displayed in Sweden. But at, at the, the second half of the season, the, the same pattern started to creep in, and, and I got less and less ice time, and it was the last year of my contract, and I knew that I had to do something. So I, I ended up asking for a trade and, and a new fresh start. Obviously, going in, walking in, and, and telling a general manager that, that just won two cups with, like you said, a star-studded team that I didn't want to, I didn't want to be part of uh, the future there. It was a big step. On the other hand, I think he, he felt the same way. There wasn't enough fight and boom on that roster for me. So I, I think it, it worked out well. And uh, there was no hard feelings either way. And there were rumors 
about me going to a few different places, Edmonton and L.A., Dallas. And, and then at the deadline, or actually past the deadline, I got a phone call from our, our general manager, Craig Patrick, saying that I got traded to Vancouver, uh, which was a place I had visited a couple of times, but didn't really know a whole lot about, but ended up being the best thing that, that ever happened to me. Well, I remember Pittsburgh called us and Craig Patrick was managing and they wanted some muscle. They were targeting Stoyanov and and they offered up Nasland. And I, th- I think it was pretty sort of late in the trading deadline. It, it came out of nowhere. Our pro scout, uh, Murray Oliver, he, he thought we should, uh, should do that trade. It was automatic for him. And I remember seeing... Marcus, uh, earlier in the season, when I was out scouting some games he had played on, uh, Penguins were on the island, and he really stood out as a guy with a lot of ability. He, he wasn't finishing, he wasn't scoring a lot at that point, but boy, he was a talented guy. And I do remember watching him a few years before that at the World Junior Tournament in Sweden, and he was a really talented guy. So... We got him, and you could see that he w- he was an exceptional talent and a real good person. He just needed some experience. He just needed to assimilate. I remember that he was a guy with a lot of skill and had been, you know, a mid-round, first-round pick. And, you know, Alex Stoyanov was, you know, a huge heart to go with his massive frame, but pretty much was of that era. He was an enforcer. There was extreme limitations to what he was going to offer you. And for the Canucks through the 90s, you know, toughness wasn't really an issue. And they could easily afford to part with Alex Storyanoff if it meant giving up some toughness to get more skill. So I liked the trade uh, at the time, but it wasn't one of those trades that got the fan base excited because you essentially were bringing in another player who essentially had struggled to start his career in Marcus Nelson. And, and there were a lot of questions about him. Is he going to be uh, an NHL player? Is he going to be an impactful NHL player? Yeah, they get an offensively gifted kid from the Pittsburgh organization. But if he's so offensively gifted, you know, why can't he make things work with Mario Lemieux and, and Yarmer Jagger and all those great Pittsburgh Penguins at the time in that lineup? It just didn't make a whole lot of sense. So it was... It was disappointment for disappointment. So why would anybody make a big deal about it? As it turned out, arguably the best deal in Canucks history. Eight days after being acquired and playing his first four games in a Canucks sweater, Naslin witnessed his first coaching change in Vancouver. Rick Lee was let go just six games before the end of the regular season. And suddenly, Pat Quinn, the man who had brokered the deal for Naslin, was not only his general manager, but also his head coach. I'm not sure if I remember exact words, but it gave me a boost of confidence in, in just in his leadership, just the type of person he was. And also it gave me a chance to play and, and play regularly, even though it took me, I don't know, eight or nine games until I, I even put up a point for him. In fact, his first points as a Canuck came in the last game of the regular season. Aslan comes in and gets the puck, stops at the side of the net, shoots, he scores! Aslan notched a hat trick in a 5 0 shutout of the Calgary Flames, giving him 22 goals for the year, the vast majority of them accrued in Pittsburgh. But neither Naslin nor the Canucks were able to parlay that strong finish into a successful postseason. Vancouver fell in the first round to a powerhouse Colorado club that would go on to win the Stanley Cup. Though Naslin registered a goal and a pair of assists in his first taste of NHL playoff hockey. 95-96 was a disappointing season because it, instead of extending this spell of superiority that they'd had, and it was really the first spell in franchise history where for more than one playoff run or more than one season, the Canucks were a very good team in the early part of the 90s and into right around 95-96. So the team started to go the other way. Vancouver was now two years removed from coming ever so close to winning hockey's holy grail, and ownership was determined to do its part in bolstering the Canucks' chances of finishing the job. Ownership, however, had a much different structure by the summer of 1996. A year earlier, Arthur Griffiths had formed a partnership with Seattle-based businessman John McCaw in order to help him finance the Canucks, the Grizzlies, and that brand new arena. 
couple of things that would not be very visible to the fan, frankly, was that the ownership was shifting from myself to Macaw at a pretty rapid pace. And I can explain that. At the time that I made the deal with my partner, John McCaw, my business relationship with him, I had 80% of the business. He had 20. In the event that I couldn't sustain the losses that might have come, as when I made the deal, I, nobody expected to go through what we went through. He would fund the losses. And there, in fact, as a direct result of that, purchase more in the business. So he would convert his investment of cash, which is just business, it's business. They had no intentions of having go that direction, but it is what it is. War, war over is that I really felt that with myself as you know, governor and chairman and CEO and all that, it was a pretty solid place to be. But eventually that was taken away. And, you know, it's their money. That's, that's that's what they do and that's what they can do. I didn't expect it. You know, when I made the deal, when the building opened and all that, we didn't expect a lockout, much less two. And another one for basketball, plus an 80, sorry, yes. Uh, let me see now. I think it was 68 cent dollar. Our expenses were uh, U.S. mostly on both teams, and our income was predominantly Canadian. So we were we were catching up, and I wasn't able to keep up. Though Griffiths wouldn't sell his stake in the team until the late stages of 1997, McCaw was calling the shots and putting his stamp on the organization long before that. McPhee was there to witness it firsthand. Oh, it changed a lot. There, there was a lot going on, and Pat actually uh, moved upstairs because there were there were bigger things to look after and he wasn't coaching. And I thought that that hurt us a little bit, the connection to Pat at that point. He was physically removed from our war room and the, the hockey operations offices. You know, you, you have to communicate, you have to be available every day. You know, there was just so much going on at that time that he had to take care of that it changed a little bit for us. Quite honestly, uh, I would say that the biggest effect in an ownership change like that is without question, that was in Pat Quinn's world. I mean, for players, you know, not much changes. We don't see it at that point anyways, because we're in the locker room. We're dealing with the coaching staff. That's our world. The trainers, the coaching staff, what happens on the ice. The biggest changes are definitely for management and Pat. And after being in that chair for the five years that I was, you know, you, you certainly realize what that ownership change, that chain reaction and, and how that led to certain things. For Trevor Linden and perhaps anyone outside the front office, the first obvious example of that change in direction was Vancouver's pursuit of the greatest hockey player of all time, Wayne Gretzky. The Grey One became a free agent in the summer of 96, and contrary to the manner in which they had operated in the past, the Canucks opened up the vault in an attempt to lure Gretzky back north. I chatted with three or four hockey clubs and had some really good conversations. Vancouver seemed to be the team that was willing to uh, meet personally, so we flew up to Seattle. My agent, Mike Barnett, and my lawyer, Ron Fujikawa, and we had a nice lunch and we were in Seattle. And after the lunch, we chatted a bit about the team itself. And, you know, coming in there, Pat was really adamant that Trevor Linden was his captain. And I assured him that my aspirations weren't to take somebody's captaincy away, that if he was the captain, that's fine by me. And I think Pat just wanted to be comfortable for me as a player that, you know, I, I was always part of a team and I always wanted to be a team guy. So I think Pat just wanted to get to know that. And that was not going to be an obstacle. Uh, I think it was John McCall who stood up and said, you know what, uh, I'm not good at negotiating. I'm going to leave. And I looked at John and I said, I'm not great at it either. I'll come with you. So John and I spent the day at his office in Seattle. We walked around the boardwalk. We ended up going to dinner. By 11 o'clock, there was not really a deal in place. All five guys were working diligently to get something done. I was teasing John that if him and I did the deal, we could have got it done in 20 minutes in his office. <laughs> Got to about 11 o'clock at night and Wayne had had enough. So he had gone back to the hotel and we got to about 11 o'clock, I think it was. And we just couldn't seem to wrap it up. We couldn't seem to get it done. Mike wanted to go back to the hotel, uh, Wayne's agent, and think about it. 
We thought, geez, if he leaves now, probably not going to get done. We encouraged him to stay, but he went back to the hotel and we just felt like it wasn't going to happen. And John McCaw had basically said, if you come to Seattle and meet us, we'll work hard for the day and the evening. And by the end of the night, we believe we'll have a deal that works for you. But that'll be it. We're not going to go on for days and days. When I went to bed, I had no idea what was going to happen. I got a call around 1.45 a.m. in the morning and said that we'd probably reached a deal. At that time, I, I really, uh, I just said, you know what, I need to call my family. You know, this is a big move for us. We went from Edmonton, Canada to L.A., and now we're going back to Canada. And I just I wanted to, you know, assure my family that this was going to be great for all of us. And that's when, you know, the delegation, I guess, really wanted an answer by the time I, I, I got the phone call. And I just wasn't comfortable making that decision. I really wanted to talk to my family before I made this drastic change, I guess, in my life and for our family. And it kind of just went off the rails at that point in time. And so we got to, now it was one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. John just pulled the plug and said, okay, we tried. They're not interested in doing it. And so uh, Stan McCammon, I believe it was, called Mike and said, we're out. I found out the next day or the day after that the Rangers had a deal with Mike that they would have a right to match whatever we did. No, that's not true at all. As a matter of fact, I hadn't really even spoken to the New York Rangers before I went to Seattle. As a matter of fact, I'm really honest, put all the cards on the table. My first offer was actually from Bob Ganey and the Dallas Stars. And I told Dallas and I told Vancouver I wasn't going to, you know, negotiate against each other. It was just more of, okay, what... What opportunity do we have here to win a Stanley Cup? And that was more more my focus than anything. I knew I was nearing the end of my career and I wanted one more chance to win a Stanley Cup. So the Rangers really weren't even in the mix at one point. I think it was Neil Smith who went to ownership at that time and president, I think, Dave Checkets and sort of convinced them to make an offer to me. All in all, I think the Rangers felt they were pretty set and comfortable in the middle. They, they were looking for maybe a couple of wingers. And, you know, so the Rangers really were not involved. And that's just a big myth. I got to have a great relationship with Pat. And we went on after I retired and we were Team Canada together. And we had some wonderful, great days and some great moments and some great memories. And we kind of used to always look at each other and kind of giggle and think what could have been. But uh, you know what? Life throws you in strange directions. And just, I guess it wasn't meant to be for whatever reason. Unable to land Gretzky, the Canucks put their wallet away and decided to bank on a new voice reinvigorating an older group. Long before that summer's free agency had begun, Quinn had decided to once again relinquish his role as head coach and hired Tom Rennie as Vancouver's new bench boss. Rennie had a dominant record in junior hockey, winning back-to-back Memorial Cups as coach of the Kamloops Blazers, and had proven he could successfully coach men at the 94 Olympics, leading Canada to a silver medal. Quinn was convinced that Rennie would be able to replicate his results at the NHL level. After all, he was inheriting a really good roster, wasn't he? Mogilny was coming off a 55-goal, 107-point season. Bure was returning from injury and the majority of the 94 team remained intact. But as is often the case in professional sports, it's easy to misjudge where a team is at by putting too much stock in where it's been. People look at the 94 thing and say, oh, that was a one-off. But what they forget is we were one of the top teams, kind of 92, should have went further, lost to uh, Edmonton in the second round, 93, should have gone further, lost to a very hot LA Kings team. Gretzky came back from injury right before the playoffs. Robbie Blake was, I think he was in his rookie year and was just finding it. And so they kind of got on a roll, beat us in the second round. And that was, for me, I remember thinking like, That was our kind of our go zone. We should, you know what I mean? And to lose in the second round like that was really, really hard because we were supposed to go further. And then that 94 season was interesting because, and I remember sitting there at Christmas time thinking, wow, we're not very good. And the thing about it was, is we weren't very good because we had a bunch of people out, you know, Nedved was holding out. And, and, you know, then after Christmas, I'll never forget, we picked up Marty Jalina and Tim Hunter, Hunter, got some guys back from injury, uh, made the big trade, and that kind of pushed us over the edge. And then that 94 run is well documented. But so those three years were kind of a window that we were, we were a good team. 
And then, you know, like every team goes through, you kind of get on the backside of it. And that's how we were in 96, kind of in the middle. We were figuring out what we were. We weren't what we were and we didn't know really where we were going. And uh, yeah, it was just a, it was a difficult time for sure. It didn't look that way at the time though. While they didn't bolt out of the gates in Rennie's inaugural NHL campaign, Vancouver got off to a decent start to the season. Neither Burray nor McGillney displayed any of the dominance they'd shown previously. However, each was producing points and the Canucks were winning more often than not. But just as had happened the year prior, two critical factors limited what the team was capable of. The first was injuries to significant players. After playing 482 consecutive games, Linden collided with Philadelphia's John LeClaire in early December and would miss the next two months with a knee injury. Burray played through pain for five months after suffering neck and shoulder injuries in the season opener, but was finally forced to shut it down in early March. Losing two of their most important offensive players proved too much to overcome for a team that was among the league's worst at preventing goals. The second limiting factor was coaching, as described by goaltender Corey Hirsch, who'd previously played for Rennie in both junior hockey and with Canada's Olympic team. I thought it would go really well with Tom Henney. I, I really did. I thought Tom, I had Tom a lot. I thought at that point through the Olympics, he got used to coaching men before his junior. So I thought he was ready for a chance. But I think Tom came in guns blazing, telling older guys what to do, veterans 15 years in the league, trying to tell them how to live their lives. And you can't tell Dave Babbage he can't have a beer on, uh, after a game, right? Like, you, how do you do that? He really wanted to make a difference, but it was the wrong way to go about it. Tom was a very, very smart coach, but guys just tuned him out right away. And Tom would admit that. He would admit that today, that he made some mistakes in that in that situation. I've talked to him about it. For the first time in seven years, Vancouver was not a playoff team. But there were bright spots if you cared to look, and Nasland was one of them. He scored more than 20 goals for the second time in as many years. And though he was hardly viewed as one of the Canucks' high-end producers at the time, it was certainly a measure of personal success given how poorly his NHL career had started. I wasn't going to get many more chances if I didn't succeed in, in the second franchise I joined. So I tried to, to focus on, on what I could control. Things were looking up for Nasland, and very soon, he and the rest of the Canucks would have every reason to believe that success was inevitable for all of them. Little did they know that the most turbulent of times were just around the corner. Coming up on the next episode of Unreal West Coast Express. When that signing was made, Messier still had that reputation as one of the great players in hockey. My initial was, wow, that's great. And then as I kind of got thinking about it, I'm like, well, this is going to be an interesting situation. It also possibly divided the locker room. The two of us were washing the skates and we went downstairs and uh, the rumor was Pat Quinn had been fired. Like, are you kidding me? Mike Keenan, the guy who beat the Canucks in the Stanley Cup final as coach is now in Vancouver and he's in without a chaperone. You knew that there was some crazy going to happen every time. Basically, you, you showed up at the ring. Like it was, it was chaos. You're thrown into a role. They said, "This is how you have to play." And that's it. Lo and behold, the whole thing fell apart. It was a, it was just a disaster. Unreal West Coast Express is a production of Toolkit Content in collaboration with Go Goat Sports. Audio production is by Andre Deacon. Writing and narration is by me, Scott Rentoul. Podcast supervision comes from Aaron Johnson. NHL game audio courtesy of the National Hockey League. Special thanks to the following NHL personnel. Hannah Riednauer, Matthew Maniker, Teresa Wiltshire, and Nick Martinez.